we have been practicing uh, silence about our history for a very long time. In this country, we don't talk about slavery, we don't talk about lynching, we don't talk about segregation, we have a hard time talking about race, uh, and it has burdened us. We don't think it's odd that we don't talk about this history. We actually think it's odd when somebody tries to talk about it. If we react to the effort of trying to talk about it as if that's the threat, not our continued silence. We're doing a lot of damage uh, to each succeeding generation. Uh, it's the 21st century, and there's still a presumption of dangerousness and guilt that gets assigned to black and brown people in this country. We haven't created spaces in America that deal honestly with the legacy of slavery. You know, my view is that the great evil of American slavery wasn't involuntary servitude and forced labor. It was the narrative of racial difference that we created to justify it. We said black people are different than white people. They can't do this, they can't do that. The Supreme Court said they're three-fifths human. And this ideology of white supremacy, that narrative of racial difference, that was the true evil. So for me, slavery doesn't end in 1865, it just evolves. It turns into decades where we have terrorism and lynching and our courts and our systems of government tolerated black people being pulled out of their homes and hung from trees, sometimes on the courthouse lawn. The legal system, the rule of law was complicit. The black people in Boston, the black people in Cleveland and Chicago and Detroit and Los Angeles and Oakland didn't go to those communities as immigrants looking for new economic opportunities. They went there as refugees and exiles from terror in the American South. And then we lived through this period of civil rights struggle that had some success, but it didn't ultimately confront that narrative of racial difference. And so now we have a system of criminal justice administration that is very racialized, where we tolerate bias and, uh, and inequality. We started out as an organization uh, trying to provide legal services to people on death row. Uh, we had a large number of people sentenced to death in the state of Alabama. It's a state that doesn't have a public defender system. And so m many people on death row um, can't find the legal help they need. And so we started this project in Alabama uh, because there was a desperate need for that. And our work has now led me back to um, thinking about race. What we want to do is to create spaces that expose people to the history of slavery and lynching and segregation so that at the end of it, you are motivated to say, never again. And then we're going to ask people, what does that mean? Does it mean that we should be tolerating some of the things that we tolerate? Does it mean we should be reacting differently when there's evidence of police misconduct or violence uh, directed at some unarmed person of color? Does it mean we should react differently if a politician starts talking about demonizing a particular group of people because of their ethnicity or their religion? If we can do that, then the legal work we're trying to do, the reform work we're trying to do, uh, just becomes a lot more achievable. I insist that we stay hopeful because I don't think we can do anything we need to do without that. And we have to get comfortable doing the uncomfortable because as much as we'd like to believe it's not true, justice never comes when you only do what's comfortable and convenient. Change never comes, oppression never ends, equality never prevails. You have to be willing uh, to raise the issues, to challenge the systems that don't educate people about the history honestly.
we can't recover uh, from this history that burdens us until we deal with it. It's a legal struggle, it's a narrative struggle, it's a hope struggle, because the other thing that has to happen in a society like ours is that you actually have to believe things you haven't seen. That's a necessary condition. In fact, I actually believe that hopelessness is the enemy of justice. Because injustice prevails where hopelessness persists. And you're either hopeful or you're the problem. There's really no middle ground. For me, that's what the law has to facilitate, the ability to get beyond where we've been to someplace better.